Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. The key moment happened in 1976 when the U.S. probes Viking 1 and Viking 2 landed on Mars. As the mission was being designed, the life-seeking experiments were selected, honed, and then picked apart to eliminate all possibility the scientists would be fooled. The researchers were under no illusions about the importance of the task. These experiments had the potential to revolutionize our view of ourselves. Find life on Mars and our perspective would be altered suddenly and forever. The mission team, together with four NASA-appointed review committees, had agreed on what would constitute success. It was only afterward, after Gil Levin's experiment met the agreed criteria, that they changed their minds. And change their minds is what they did. Gil Levin's experiment returned positive results. It behaved as predicted when they did the test again, and they announced that they had found life on Mars. You're listening to episode 180 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about whether life exists on Mars. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to stick around for the end of the episode, as we'll have your feedback on our recent episodes, two-part episodes, on 9-11. But first, for centuries, people have wondered whether there is life on Mars. For a time, many scientists were convinced that there is. Then this fell into doubt. But now the pendulum's been swinging back the other way. Is there life on Mars? How did it get there, and what is it like? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, where did we leave off last week? We covered the history of what people thought about the possibility of life on Mars down to the 1970s, when the first Viking landers touched down on the planet. This included the 19th century studies that suggested there was a planet-wide network of canals on Mars, implying not just life, but a civilization there. For now, we're going to go look at the 1970s Viking results, the controversy that ensued, and the evidence that we've gotten since the 1970s. And as we'll see, there is significant evidence that life does exist on Mars, so you'll definitely want to listen. In our opening segment, we heard about tests that were done with the Viking 1 and Viking 2 probes that landed on Mars in 1976. Before the mission launched, scientists agreed on the criteria that would indicate the successful discovery of life, and a test by Gil Levin showed just that, that there is life on Mars. But then the higher-ups at NASA changed their minds and altered the criteria after life was discovered. So what happened? To understand that, we need to know about how Gil Levin's test worked. It was known as the Labeled Release Experiment, and in his book, 13 Things That Don't Make Sense, Michael Brooks explains it this way. The experiment gained its name through the radioactive carbon it used to label the gas released by anything that metabolized it. To produce a culture of microorganisms, you generally put some into a soup of nutrients in a petri dish. They feed on the nutrients and begin to multiply. Levin tweaked this idea in a very simple way by adding radioactive isotopes to the nutrients. The metabolism of microorganisms means that they will release gas derived from whatever they've been feeding on. If they've been feeding on radioactive carbon, a Geiger counter above the gas should go crazy. The plan was simple. Add radioactive nutrients to a soil sample containing microbes and watch for a rising graph from the radiation detector. Then, if it works, heat the soil sample to 320 degrees Fahrenheit killing the microbes, and repeat. You can add all the radioactive nutrients you like, but you won't get radioactive gas if the microbes are all dead the second time. 
It worked for finding microbes in suspect water, and it worked when tested on Earth using California soil. And then it worked on Mars. And you can imagine just how exciting that was for Levin and the others on his team. It was July 30th, 1976, when Levin saw the first graph showing that Martian soil is just like California soil. A day earlier, the robot arm on the Viking lander had scooped Mars dirt into a box that distributed a little of it among four chambers. Each one contained half a cubic centimeter of soil. The chambers were sealed, and for the next 24 hours, the radiation detector monitored the background radiation in the air above the soil. It was a flat line. Then the nutrient went in. It was a microbe's perfect lunch, with an extra kick from a little radioactive carbon-14. Fifteen hours later, the flat line shot upward. Radioactive gas was filling the microbe chamber. To start with, the assembled scientists were startled by the similarity to Earth-bound data. They had seen this signature hundreds of times in their tests. Then they got over their shock and had a party. Levin went out and bought some champagne. He even got himself a cigar. They printed the graph, then everyone on the team signed it. The big hit show of the time was West Side Story, and Levin wrote the title of one of its songs, Tonight, on the top of the printout. Levin was the happiest man in the solar system, but his joy wasn't to last. And not for the reason you might think. They had the second test coming up where they'd bake any microbes in the soil to death and then repeat the experiment. If radioactive gas was released, even though there shouldn't be any surviving microbes in the soil, then that would mean it was just soil chemistry and not microbes that had been responsible in the first test. But if no radioactive gas was produced in the second test, that would mean that there were microbes in the first test and that they had been killed by the sterilizing heat. So the second test could disprove the life result that Levin and his team got, but that wasn't the problem. Brooks writes, As agreed, the labeled release team later carried out a control experiment, heating one of the soil samples to 320 degrees before adding the nutrient. The line stayed flat, making the initial indication of life a strong scientific result. The labeled release team had met the four criteria that NASA had agreed signaled the presence of life on the red planet. So the second test did what it needed to and confirmed that it had been microbes that produced the results of the first test. And that wasn't all. Viking was also carrying a second type of test known as the pyrolytic release test, and it also indicated life. The second, the pyrolytic release experiment, seemed to give a positive result. During a five-day test, organic molecules, the basis of biology, were created by something in collected Martian soil. The scientist's best guess was that some kind of algae was responsible. Two of Viking's experiments were thus pointing to the existence of life. If that was the case, why'd they change their minds? A third experiment pointed the other way. According to Brooks, The gas exchange experiment gave a negative. It mixed a scientist's version of chicken soup, a broth of nutrients, with Martian soil. Analyzing the gases given off, the researchers concluded the soil contained nothing that had thrived on the nutrients. So you had two experiments saying life and one experiment saying we didn't find life, which is not the same thing as saying it's not there, just that we didn't find it. The higher-ups then decided to let another experiment, a fourth one, cast the deciding vote. But this would be a really problematic decision. In a way, the fourth experiment, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, or GCMS, which would test the soil for organic, that is, carbon-based compounds, held the casting vote, which is a pity because it didn't work properly. The thinking behind the GCMS experiment was, if there were organisms on Mars, the soil would be littered with decaying bodies, assemblies of carbon molecules. The experiment would take soil samples from Mars, roast them, and analyze the gases given off. If there was any carbon present, the experiment would detect the presence of volatile carbon-based chemicals. Unfortunately, the experiment had problems. They had started en route. While Viking 1 was cruising toward Mars, a test showed that one of the three ovens in the GCMS apparatus used to heat soil samples so they would give off gases wasn't working. 
Then, on Mars, it turned out that the indicator showing a soil sample had been successfully delivered to the second oven, but it didn't work either. Two out of three ovens had failed, and that was before Levin's experiment had even run. After Levin's successful run, with the outcome of the mission resting on the GCMS's result, Levin held his breath while the GCMS's third oven was fed a sample. Six Martian days after the sample failed to register in the second oven, the same thing happened again. Not wanting to risk heating an empty oven, they went through the emptying routine, just in case, and waited for the next soil dig to come around. That was 17 Martian days later. There was still no indication of whether the sample had been delivered, but the GCMS team went ahead anyway. The only data that came from the instrument showed that the oven still contained microscopic traces of the cleaning solvent used by NASA engineers prior to launch. So when they finally ran this experiment, they were using a broken apparatus that couldn't even tell them if they had the needed soil sample in the last remaining oven. Not exactly convincing results. And what about Viking 2? They had another lander elsewhere on the planet. What did its results show? Michael Brooks explains. The GCMS experiment was run four times in total. The Viking 2 attempts, housed in an identical lander that followed Viking 1, at least registered samples in the ovens. But no trace of organic material was detected in any of the four runs, and no organic material, in the team leader's interpretation, meant no life. So with two tests saying life had been discovered and two apparently saying that it hadn't, the mission leaders announced to the public that they had found, quote, no evidence close quote, of life on Mars, which was not true. They had found evidence as supplied by the two positive tests, just not evidence they found conclusive since they changed the pre-agreed upon criteria. How did Levin respond? He was disappointed, and that's understandable. If they hadn't changed the criteria after the fact, he and the team would have won the Nobel Prize for one of the most important scientific discoveries in human history. It must have been absolutely crushing when they changed the criteria. But he lived with the results and kept looking into possible explanations for the results they got, both explanations that involved life and explanations that did not involve it. And eventually, he heard from some people who had some startling news about the GCMS experiment. It turned out this test had failed repeatedly before launch. They'd tried testing samples of Antarctic soil in it, and the GCMS had said that there was no organic material in the Antarctic soil when there really was. But they were in such a rush to get ready for the launch that they put the GCMS test on board the Viking probes despite its demonstrated failures. Eventually, it was concluded that the problem was that the test was not sensitive enough to detect small quantities of organics like you'd find in Antarctic or Martian soil. Michael Brooks explains... A few years later, one of the engineers on the GCMS project approached Levin with a story similar to Lavoie's. Arthur Lafleur had been brought onto the project to help it meet its mission deadline and had co-authored the paper that reported the negative findings on Mars. But, he said, the machine really wasn't anywhere near as sensitive as it needed to be to refute Levin's results. Levin and Lafleur published a paper together in 2000, exposing for the first time some of the pre-flight results from the GCMS experiment. It had repeatedly failed to find organic compounds that were present in samples. Antarctic soils contained 10,000 organisms per gram of soil, but even at concentrations of 3 billion organisms per gram, the GCMS would have failed to spot organic compounds. Martian soil can probably contain no more than 10 million organisms per gram. In short, they said, the GCMS was unequal to its assigned task. And by 2000, when they published the article, this wasn't controversial. Others at NASA had concluded that the test simply was not sensitive enough. In 2006, the final nail was driven into the coffin of the GCMS experiment when a team of 12 researchers, including NASA's Mars expert Chris McKay, published a paper on the experiment in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The sensitivity of the GCMS experiment, it concluded, 
was several orders of magnitude lower than originally thought. The question of whether organic compounds exist on the surface of the planet Mars was not conclusively answered by the organic analysis experiment carried out by the Viking landers, the paper states. So the real results of the Viking mission were that with both landers, we had two tests that said life was discovered, one test that didn't find life, and one test that wasn't sensitive enough to do its job. On balance, that pointed to life, and Levin and others became convinced that we really did find life on Mars in the 1970s. And guess what? We now have evidence that essentially undoes the negative GCMS test. In 2018, NASA announced that the Curiosity rover has discovered organic molecules in sedimentary rocks on Mars that are 3 billion years old. So contrary to the not sensitive enough GCMS test in the 1970s, we now know that Martian soil does contain organic molecules. If you were to allow this new information to sub for the GCMS test, that would be three tests pointing to life and only one that didn't find it. Even more reason to suspect life on Mars. Are the Viking experiments the end of the story at this point? By no means. Since 1976, there have been repeated indications that there is life on Mars. For example, in 1996, NASA made the dramatic announcement that they had found evidence, strong evidence, in a Martian meteorite that had been discovered in Antarctica. According to the NASA press release at the time, a NASA research team of scientists at the Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas, and at Stanford University, Palo Alto, California, has found evidence that strongly suggests primitive life may have existed on Mars more than 3.6 billion years ago. The NASA-funded team found the first organic molecules thought to be of Martian origin, several mineral features characteristic of biological activity, and possible microscopic fossils of primitive bacteria-like organisms inside of an ancient Martian rock that fell to Earth as a meteorite. This array of indirect evidence of past life will be reported in the August 16 issue of the journal Science, presenting the investigation to the scientific community at large for further study. The two-year investigation was co-led by JSC planetary scientists Dr. David McKay, Dr. Everett Gibson, and Kathy Thomas Keptra of Lockheed Martin, with the major collaboration of a Stanford team headed by Professor of Chemistry Dr. Richard Zaire, as well as six other NASA and university research partners. There is not any one finding that leads us to believe that this is evidence of past life on Mars. Rather, it is a combination of many things that we have found, McKay said. They include Stanford's detection of an apparently unique pattern of organic molecules, carbon compounds that are the basis of life. We also found several unusual mineral phases that are known products of primitive microscopic organisms on Earth. Structures that could be microscopic fossils seem to support all of this. The relationship of all of these things in terms of location, within a few hundred thousandths of an inch of one another, is the most compelling evidence. It is very difficult to prove life existed 3.6 billion years ago on Earth, let alone on Mars, Zare said. The existing standard of proof, which we think we have met, includes having an accurately dated sample that contains native microfossils, mineralogical features characteristic of life, and evidence of complex organic chemistry. For two years, we have applied state-of-the-art technology to perform these analyses, and we believe we have found quite reasonable evidence of past life on Mars, Gibson added. We don't claim that we have conclusively proven it, we are putting this evidence out to the scientific community for other investi investigators to verify, enhance, attack, disprove if they can, as part of the scientific process. Then, within a year or two, we hope to resolve the question one way or the other. What we have found to be the most reasonable interpretation is of such radical nature that it will only be accepted or rejected after other groups either confirm our findings or overturn them, McKay added. Following this dramatic announcement, President Bill Clinton then spoke. I'm glad to be joined by my science and technology advisor, Dr. Jack Gibbons. 
to make a few comments about today's announcement by NASA. This is the product of years of exploration and months of intensive study by some of the world's most distinguished scientists. Like all discovery, this one will and should continue to be reviewed, examined, and scrutinized. It must be confirmed by other scientists. But clearly, the fact that something of this magnitude is being explored is another vindication of America's space program. It is well worth contemplating how we reach this moment of discovery. More than four billion years ago, this piece of rock was formed as a part of the original crust of Mars. After billions of years, it broke from the surface and began a 16 million year journey through space that would end here on Earth. It arrived in a meteor shower 13,000 years ago. And in 1984, an American scientist on an annual US government mission to search for meteors on Antarctica picked it up and took it to be studied. Appropriately, it was the first rock to be picked up that year, rock number 84001. Today, rock 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. Its implications are as far-reaching and awe-inspiring as can be imagined. Even as it promises answers to some of our oldest questions, it poses still others even more fundamental. We will continue to listen closely to what it has to say as we continue the search for answers and for knowledge that is as old as humanity itself, but essential to our people's future. Thank you. I want to take a moment before we continue our discussion to thank our patrons who make it possible for this show to be made, including Aaron W., Rocco F., Matthew K., Teresa H., and Robert G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group, all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. So, Jimmy, what happened after NASA and President Clinton made their announcements? The scientific community got cold feet again. Just like in the 1970s, they'd found what really looked like good evidence of life on Mars, and it held up under multiple tests. But other scientists started proposing hypothetical ways of explaining the same features in this meteor, in this meteorite, that didn't involve life. They didn't have proof that any of these things had happened. They didn't disprove the biological origin of the features in the meteorite but they were able to cast enough doubt on individual features that most people in the scientific community decided to take the easy way out and dismiss the findings. The standard in place is apparently deny the value of any evidence unless you have irrefutable proof of life. It doesn't matter how good the evidence is, unless it's absolutely irrefutable, just deny that it's life. We now have other meteorites from Mars. What do they show? According to David McKay and his team from the Johnson Space Center, evidence for life on Mars has continued to mount since the, 1970, uh, the 1996 discovery. They've continued studying meteorite 84001 and additional meteorites, and they continue to show evidence for life on Mars. In 2009 and 2010, McKay and his team published additional material on this, according to a story in Spaceflight Now. The team that found evidence of Martian life in a meteorite that landed in Antarctica believes that during 2010, by using advanced instrumentation on now three Martian meteorites, it will be able to definitively prove whether such features are truly fossils of alien life on the Red Planet. 
This new information goes well beyond the updated findings released by NASA in November 2009 about signatures for magnetic type bacteria. We do not yet believe that we have rigorously proven that there is or was life on Mars, says David S. McKay, chief of astrobiology at the NASA Johnson Space Center. But we do believe that we are very, very close to proving there is or has been life there, McKay tells Spaceflight Now. The team, however, believes it has since tripled its fossil-like data by finding more biomorphs, suspected Martian fossils, inside two additional Martian meteorites, as well as more evidence at other spots in the Allen Hills meteorite itself. The Houston-based scientists believe the age spread of their data from 3.6 billion to 1.4 billion years ago shows that a planet-wide network of microorganisms came to life underground on Mars 3.6 billion years ago during the first billion years after Mars had formed along with the rest of the planets in the solar system. Mars was much warmer and wetter with a much thicker atmosphere then. Simple life forms were beginning to form on Earth at about the same time. According to the Johnson Space Center team, the three Martian meteorites with the apparent fossil signatures include what appear to be mats of bacteria and specific other biological signatures that are common to all three meteorites. They are also highly similar to undisputed microfossil life of ancient organisms found in Earth's rocks like Columbia River basalts in Washington state. So even more evidence for life on Mars. And today, in 2021, it isn't three Martian meteorites showing signs of past life. It's now four. So even more evidence beyond what we had in 2010, the year we again made contact. And we're not just seeing these things in meteorites from Mars. The Curiosity rover has also been seeing microscopic structures in sedimentary rocks at Vera Rubin Ridge on Mars that are consistent with tunnels made by microscopic organisms. Geologic evidence from meteorites, or even from rocks on Mars itself, would speak to ancient life on Mars, but it could have died off when Mars lost most of its atmosphere and went cold. Do we have any evidence that suggests life on Mars today? Well, as we talked about last episode, I think if life ever gets a foothold on a planet like Mars, it will be able to adapt to changes. So I don't think it would all die off. But there are various factors that some scientists have been pointing to. Uh, for example, the orbiters that we've sent have noticed some unusual activity around Mars's south pole. The activity occurs in the Martian spring as temperatures are getting slightly warmer. Basically, dark shapes start appearing on the surface. Some of these are round or oval blobs, and they're known as dark dune spots because they appear on sand dunes. Others are radial patterns that look kind of like giant spiders, so they're called spiders, even though they're claimed to be a geological feature. And yes, that gives us another David Bowie connection as his backing band was known as the Spiders of Mars, particularly in his Ziggy Stardust phase. In any event, the dark dune spots and spiders can appear quickly, even in just a few days, which is unusual for the slow geological processes you'd expect on Mars. The current theory is that they're produced by the current non-life theory is that they're produced by geysers of some kind, spraying water or carbon dioxide and carrying subsurface soil up with it. And then, over the course of the Martian year, they fade only to be renewed again next spring. That kind of cycle corresponds to the way plants grow and then die off over the course of a terrestrial year. And frankly, these things look organic. So some scientists have proposed that they are organic. Wikipedia summarizes... A team of Hungarian scientists proposed that the geyser's most visible features, dark dune spots and spider channels, may be colonies of photosynthetic Martian microorganisms, which overwinter beneath the ice cap and as the sunlight returns to the pole during early spring, light penetrates the ice, the microorganisms photosynthesize, and heat their immediate surroundings. A pocket of liquid water, which would normally evaporate instantly in the thin Martian atmosphere, is trapped around them by the overlying ice. As this ice layer thins, 
the microorganisms show through gray. When the layer has completely melted, the microorganisms rapidly dry out and turn black, surrounded by a gray aureole. The Hungarian scientists believe that even a complex sublimation process is insufficient to explain the formation and evolution of the dark dune spots in space and time. A multinational European team suggests that if liquid water is present in the spider's channels during their annual defrost cycle, they might provide a niche where certain microscopic life forms could have retreated and adapted while sheltered from solar radiation. A British team also considers the possibility that organic matter, microbes, or even simple plants might coexist with these inorganic formations, especially if the mechanism includes liquid water and a geothermal energy source. So we may already have pictures of Martian life and just not be recognizing it for what it is. In fact, this episode's artwork is an actual photograph of the Martian surface showing what really looks like trees or some kind of tree-like life form around Mars's North Pole. We'll have a link to an article where they try to dismiss this as an illusion and claim it's basaltic sand patterns pumped up by carbon dioxide geysers but it does not look like sand streaks on the surface. It looks like tall plants sticking up out of the surface. And in light of all the other evidence of life on Mars, maybe you don't have to try to automatically cram any image you see into that looks like life into a box that says it's not life. Some scientists have been proposing that we could look for signs of life or biosignatures in the atmospheres of other planets. Have we found anything like that for Mars? Yes, there are various gases and chemical compounds that are associated with life. And life tends to work in a cyclical seasonal fashion, at least on planets that have seasons. So if we see these gases and chemicals changing in a planet's atmosphere, if the atmosphere is in disequilibrium with respect to them, that can indicate life is there especially if the phenomenon behaves in a cyclical way, like the changing of the seasons affects what life does here on Earth. And what have they found in the case of Mars's atmosphere? Methane, which is a carbon atom hooked up to four hydrogen atoms. Methane is chemically unstable in Mars's atmosphere, and any methane that's there should be quickly degraded by the solar radiation coming through. But we found methane in Mars's atmosphere, so something is replenishing it. The question is whether that's a geological or a biological something. Both are hypothetically possible. There are geological processes that produce methane here on Earth, but not a lot of it. Most of the methane on Earth is produced by living organisms in a process known as methanogenesis. For example, this is done by microbes known as methanogens, or methane producers. And it turns out that the methane in Mars's atmosphere isn't consistent all over the planet. It's localized, and it varies with time. So Mars's atmosphere is in methane disequilibrium, with a cycle where it builds up, then drops, then builds up again. That cycle based in particular locations on the planet's surface is suggestive of colonies of Martian life producing methane as they go through their life cycles. We've also found traces of formaldehyde in Mars's atmosphere. Formaldehyde is a carbon atom with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom attached, and it can be made by oxidizing methane. It has been suggested that this is where Mars's formaldehyde is coming from. And that would suggest either that Mars is more geologically active than we think, or that it's got life that's, or, that's oxidizing the methane to produce the formaldehyde. If we have all of this evidence for life from Viking and other probes, why haven't we sent a probe to confirm it? Why has there been no follow-up on the Viking results? We could just send another lander with the same tests that Viking had, or even better, improved ones. 
We could, and the fact we haven't has resulted in NASA getting a lot of criticism. Instead of looking for life itself, which is what people are really interested in, NASA has been looking for conditions that could support life or could have supported it in the past. They've been tiptoeing around the issue rather than trying to answer the question that people want answered. A lot of people have been very frustrated by one mission after another looking for conditions that could support life instead of missions that would just answer the question. And there's a new round of criticism every time NASA launches such a mission. Why haven't they been looking for life itself? It's hard to say. Uh, it looks like they're gun shy for some reason and they're being hyper cautious. That could be due to an excess of scientific caution. It could be because they're afraid of being embarrassed if they get it wrong. It could be that they're intimidated by the size of the problem because even if you don't find life on one part of Mars, that doesn't mean it isn't somewhere else on Mars. It could be that they don't have confidence in their ability to detect microbial life at a distance using a probe. It could be that they're afraid that if they do another Viking and they get a no-life result, that it would end public interest in exploring Mars and their funding would be cut. So who knows? Are there any bright spots on this front? Actually, yes. Earlier this year, we landed a rover on Mars named Perseverance, and this one is designed to take samples that can later be returned to Earth for study. That would let us put them under microscopes here on Earth and run all kinds of tests on them that we couldn't easily pack onto a probe because, you know, weight is at a premium when you're doing a, a planetary mission like this. Unfortunately, a Mars sample return mission is still at the hypothetical stage, so it's all nebulous at this point, and in any event, we wouldn't have the results for years. In the meantime, what does the current state of the evidence say about life on Mars? As I mentioned, uh, Gil Levin passed away only a few months ago, but up till the end of his life, he continued to work on the issue of life on Mars, and he believed we have strong evidence that it's there. Unfortunately, he can now never win the Nobel Prize, no matter what results we get in the future, because the Nobel Committee doesn't award prizes to scientists who have passed away. But last year, in 2020, he published a summary of the evidence, which we're going to read. It's called Mars Life Status 2020 Hard and Circumstantial Evidence, and it says... Viking Labeled Release, or LR, is an adaptation of Louis Pasteur's test for microorganisms now used by health departments around the world. Carbon-14 was added to the test broth to improve sensitivity, and simple substrates ubiquitously used by terrestrial organisms were added to increase its scope. In some 4,000 tests of soil containing pure and mixed microbial cultures on Earth, the LR has amassed the impressive providence of never having produced a false positive or false negative result. No one has ever challenged the Viking LR data or the accuracy of the test or instrument. Viewed objectively, LR more than satisfied requirements for verification and proof of life on Mars. On Viking 1, the LR duplicated its initial positive result and confirmed the positives with stringent controls. The entire process was duplicated and thus replicated by Viking 2 some 4,000 miles away. The Viking LR Mars results were rejected because of the failure of the Molecular Analysis Instrument, GCMS, Gas Chromatograph Mass Spectrometer, to detect organics. Yet this instrument had frequently failed in pre-mission tests on Earth. Levin then asked why certain data the Curiosity rover promised to deliver has not been announced. Where are the data Curiosity promised on complex organics to be determined by a wet extraction method? If they did not do the run, how come NASA announced finding probable kerogen, which is of organic origin only? Liquid water was detected by Viking 2 and several times by later missions, but officially denied until Curiosity reported several percent moisture in the Martian soil. Images from several missions showing greenish patches on rocks and surface areas were denied for many years. Why have there been no spectral analyses of this green color? 
Why is there no isotopic ratio data on methane? Why no isotopic analysis of regional atmospheric CO2? Based on our current knowledge, there is no possibility Mars could be sterile. NASA said discovery of life on Mars may be possibly the greatest experiment in the history of science. Why has there been no verifying mission or even independent review of existing data by an academic institution? Levin then lists multiple additional items of evidence, some of which you may be surprised to hear about if you haven't followed the literature on this, like Martian will-o'-the-wisps, fungi, mushrooms, and chlorophyll. Specific hard and circumstantial evidence. 1. Amino acids and many other organics have been found all over the reachable cosmos. 2. Biological fossils have been found in meteorites by many scientists. 3. Liquid water and biologically complex organic compounds, all key elements of life, including carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, have been found on Mars. 4. Terrestrial microorganisms have been grown under Martian environmental conditions, and even harsher. 5. Microbes on Earth could be impelled to Mars in bolides launched by meteor meteoric impact and land in viable form. All the parameters have been verified, and lab studies have shown that some terrestrial micro microbial species could survive and grow under Martian conditions. 6. The Viking Mission 1 LR test and a series of increasingly decisive varied controls more than satisfied NASA's pre-mission requirements for the detection of extant life. 7. Then, as dictated by the scientific method, the Viking 1 LR repeated the test. This duplication verified the first test and controls, thereby establishing the grounds for scientific proof. 8. In a separate mission, Viking 2 replicated the experiment and also duplicated it. All its results completely confirmed the presence of extant microbes. 9. Viking 2 detected greenish patches on some rocks. Analyzed with the six-channel Viking imaging system, the spectrum of the patches completely matched that of terrestrial lichen when similarly or analyzed. 10. Precise replicates of the patches taken at yearly intervals for three Martian years showed the shapes had changed, with no changes in the surrounding field, thereby eliminating wind and dust as an explanation. 11. Chlorophyll was reported by spectral analysis of the Martian surface and on the lander deck. Although the respected scientists who made this claim withdrew the published peer-reviewed publication, coercion is, is suspected. 12. Ultraviolet UV activation of the Martian surface material did not, as initially proposed by some, cause the LR reaction. A sample taken from under a UV shielding rock was as LR active as surface samples. 13. Among complex organics reported on Mars by Curiosity scientists is possibly kerogen, which is only of biological origin. 14. The Phoenix and Curiosity rovers concluded that the ancient Martian environment was habitable. They did not conclude that it was not still so. 15. The excess of carbon-13 over carbon-12 in the Martian atmosphere is strongly indicative of biological activity which prefers ingesting the latter. 16. The Martian atmosphere is in disequilibrium. Its CO2 should long ago have been converted to CO by the sun's UV light. Thus, the CO2 is being regenerated, possibly by biology, including microorganisms, as on Earth. 17. Methane has been measured in the Martian atmosphere both cyclically and locally. Microbial methanogens could be the source. 18. The rapid disappearance of methane from the ma Martian atmosphere requires a sink, possibly supplied by methanotrophs, methane eaters, that could coexist with methanogens, methane producers, on the Martian surface. 19. Ghost-like moving lights resembling will-o'-the-wisps on Earth that are formed by spontaneous ignition of methane have been video recorded on the Martian surface. 20. Formaldehyde and ammonia, each possibly indicative of biology, are claimed to be in the Martian atmosphere. 21. An independent complexity analysis of the positive LR signal identified it as biological. 
22. A worm-like feature was in an image taken by curiosity. 23. Large structures resembling terrestrial stromatolites or layered sedimentary rocks formed only by microorganisms were found by curiosity. A statistical analysis of their complex structures showed the probability was less than 0.004 that the similarity could be caused by chance alone. 24. Images sent by curiosity bear strong resemblance to metazoans or multicellular life forms as assessed by experts. 25. Images sent by curiosity also bear features resembling mushrooms as assessed by experts. The mushrooms are seen to expand and new ones pop up out of the ground in images taken several days apart. 26. Nothing inimical to life, even as we know it on Earth, has been found on Mars. Phew! Good job reading those 26 points, Dom. <laughs> and listeners can go back and listen to them again to really appreciate the different lines of evidence being uh, addressed. After all that, Levin concludes... In summary, we have positive results from a test adapted from one used by public health departments daily to test for microbial contamination of the drinking water of billions of peoples in cities around the world. Supportive responses from strong and varied controls. Duplication of the LR results at each of the two Viking sites. Replication of the experiment at the two Viking sites. With the above copious additional hard and circumstantial evidence for life on Mars, and the failure for over 44 years of any experiment or theory to provide a scientifically supportable non-biological explanation of the Viking LR results. What is the evidence against the possibility of life on Mars? The astonishing fact is that there is none. And that's something else, in fact, the, that you may want to listen to again. In fact, you may want to repeat the whole episode because there's a lot of data here and it may take more than one listen to catch it all. But Levin believed we have very strong evidence for life on Mars. And notice that it isn't just the number of different pieces of evidence that he cites that's significant. It isn't that they all have to pan out. Any individual piece of evidence could have a non-biological explanation. But if even one of them is biological, then there's life on Mars. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line on life on Mars? I agree with Levin. I think there is life on Mars. I can't say it for certain, but if push comes to shove, I think it's probably there. What I don't know is whether it started there or here or somewhere else. I think there, there's a good chance it started on Mars, in which case it is still there, because once life starts and gets a good foothold, it can adapt to almost any conditions. It's even possible that life started on Mars before it started on Earth, in which case it may have been seeded to Earth by meteorites, or it may have been taken to Mars by meteorites that were blown off the surface of the Earth by impacts, or at least a little microbial life, not what Viking detected, but a little microbial life could have come to Mars by the probes we've just recently sent there. But one way or another, I suspect that there is at least microbial life on Mars, and maybe simple fungi, plants, or animals. But whether life on Mars ever got to the advanced stage, and whether there was ever a civilization there, is a subject we'll have to leave to future episodes. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the viewer and listener on this? We'll have a link to Bradley Schaefer's audio course, The Remarkable Science of Ancient Astronomy, which uh, we talked about uh, last week. Also, Michael Brooks's book, 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. Marsha Bartusiak's book, The Day We Found the Universe. Percival Lowell's book, Mars and Its Canals. Gil Levin's website, also his 2020 summary of the evidence. Uh, articles about life on Mars, Christian Huygens, Giovanni Scaparelli, Percival Lowell, the Martian canals, uh, video dealing with the flash floods on Mars we talked about last time, also information, a uh, video of David Bowie's song, Life on Mars, because yes, I had that running through my head as I did this. 
Also, Orson Welles' uh, War of the Worlds uh, broadcast, info on Lucian of Samosata, his uh, work, A True Story. Um, and then uh, the 1962 Science Journal article on Martian biology, uh, the 1996 NASA announcement, the 1996 Clinton announcement, information about Meteor ALH 84001, information about the tree-like structures on Mars. And then lastly, we're going to have a link to a video version of an album that I bought in the 1980s at OakCon. OakCon was a science fiction convention in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I drive over to it from my hometown in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I got this audio cassette of an album called Dr. Jane's Science Notes, which is a filk album. If you're not familiar with filk music, it is science fiction folk music that gets sung at science fiction conventions. And so this was an album of it uh, by an artist named Jane Robinson. And one of the, the particular songs on the album is called A Look at Things That Don't Exist. And what this song does is it satirizes, pokes fun at, uh, scientism's ability to dismiss perfectly real evidence through various means. And it seemed appropriate, given all the perfectly reasonable evidence that at least needs to be put in a balance with regard to does Martian life exist? I mean, even if you can dismiss a single point, when you get lots of different pieces of evidence, they have a collective weight that the individual parts don't. And it doesn't make sense to do what NASA did and said, we found no evidence, when what you mean is we didn't find evidence that was strong enough to convince us. There's a difference between not having any evidence at all and evidence that you didn't find convincing. Those are two different things. And that's a technique that gets used to dismiss actual evidence and its value. So after all the science denialism, to use a term I don't like, um, with regard to life on Mars and the evidence we have concerning it, it seemed appropriate to end the episode with a look at things that don't exist. <laughs> all right. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback. As promised, it's from our recent two-parter on 9-11. And our first feedback is some audio feedback, so let me play that now. Howdy, guys. Chris Nugent from Bryan, Texas here. Love you guys and your show. I got into a discussion with a truther sometime after the attack centering on the debate about whether an airplane could bring down a whole building the size of the Twin Towers. It seemed to me that the debate was settled by the numerous engineers and agencies that factored in the amount of fuel in the planes, the materials in the building, and the elevator shafts that supplied plenty of air to reach destructive temperatures. But I couldn't come up with an answer to this question. Did the attackers know that was going to happen? Or was it just icing on their evil plot cake? What are your thoughts? Thanks and God bless. Thank you very much for the audio evidence, or for the audio feedback. And as uh, longtime listeners will know, if you send us audio feedback, even if it's just with the record function on your phone and you email it to us, it goes right to the top of the list of the feedback we're going to use. Um, in terms of uh, the question you pose, um, the best evidence that I have comes from uh, the recording of the videotape recording of the dinner party that Osama bin Laden had uh, with some associates after the attack, but prior to the um, to the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, and in that recording, my memory is that he says the damage done by the attack exceeded their expectations. They so that would indicate that they didn't think it was going to be as dramatic as it turned out to be. However, people have questioned whether that uh, videotape is real or not, or whether it's been accurately translated or not. And so that's why I didn't use that videotape as evidence when we did the 9-11 two-parter. Uh, but that's the best evidence I've got, that they didn't expect that it would be as successful in terms of damage as it was. Excellent. 
Then uh, we have an email from Paul who writes, You did a great job giving a good summary of all the main events and questions surrounding the 9-11 attacks, especially considering what you said about the massive amount of material available on the subject. That raised a bigger question in my mind. What strategy can you suggest for people who want to learn about a topic but are faced with an overwhelming amount of books, articles, videos, etc. on the subject? It's even harder when it comes to controversial and highly politicized topics in which opinions vary even among the experts. For example, climate change, drug policy, the pandemic, etc. What I try to do when I'm researching a highly controversial topic like this is I try to find one or two high quality resources from the different perspectives. So I'll try to find, like with 9-11, one or two high quality books or documentaries from a standard perspective and then one or two similar uh, high quality books or documentaries from an alternative perspective. And then I try to digest both of them and see how they interact with each other's arguments. Excellent. Then Joe sends an email. Well, Jimmy and Dom, y'all have done it again. Through the use of logic and reason, you've managed to dispel many of my preconceived notions on a topic. I earnestly believed that controlled demolitions were involved in the collapse of the World Trade Center buildings, especially Building 7. Jimmy's excellent application of logic and reason when discussing a topic has also convinced me of one other thing. Jimmy Aiken is a Vulcan. Well, as one of my ancestors said, whenever you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Wait, didn't I hear a Vulcan say that once? <laughs> all right. And then we have uh, several comments, several bits of feedback that are all related. So I'll read them all at once. Oh, actually, and... there's one. There's another short one first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. I missed that one. Mark writes on Facebook, Zionists were behind the attacks. It's been covered up for decades. So... One of the things that is sometimes claimed is that people will use code words when they don't want to say something straight out. And I've always been skeptical of that claim. I, th I think people normally are pretty straightforward in what they say, and you should take them as, at face value. The term Zionist means person who supports the existence of Israel as a political state. But you don't have to be an Israeli to be a Zionist. There are lots of people who think, yeah, it's fine for Israel to exist. And they can be Americans, they can be Europeans, they can be Africans or Asians. Lots of people all over the world think it's a good thing to have a state for, for Israel. Other people oppose that. And, you know, that's a, a subject on which people have different opinions. But anybody who says, yeah, it's fine for Israel to have its own state, is a Zionist. And I don't think that what Mark is saying here, it is that people who think it's fine for Israel to exist as a state caused the 9-11 attacks. I think he means something more specific than that. And it is what he says is consistent, not just with anti-Zionism, which would be the position that you don't think Israel should be a state, um, but it's consistent with anti-Semitism, that is, hostility towards the Jewish people. And so even though I normally am a big believer in taking people at face value with the language they use, in this case, the language is, doesn't make sense if you take it at face value. Uh, because American evangelicals typically are very much in support of Israel as a state, but that doesn't mean American evangelicals were the plotters of 9-11 or other Zionists around the world. I think what Mark is saying here is likely to be understood as Jews were behind the attacks, but he's not wanting to say the word Jews so as not to be accused of anti-Semitism. Um, I did. We did have a number of people who expressed thoughts along these lines, and some other people who uh, who wanted us to talk about the stream of anti-Semitism that is present in our society. Because there's hostility against every group of people. It doesn't matter what group you're a member of. Someone is hostile to your group, and that's going to be as true of Jews as it is anybody else. Um, but we shouldn't allow our animosity towards particular groups to 
color our understanding or appreciation or evaluation of the evidence. And animosity, you know, towards any group is a problem. And it can be very ugly. But we need to try to, whatever our feelings are regarding particular groups and whatever our suspicions are, we need to not be subject to confirmation bias. We need to try to set them aside, look charitably and fairly and open-mindedly at the evidence and see whether it really does support whether a particular group was involved in something. And I don't think the evidence uh, would support the idea that Israelis were behind 9-11, which is something we'll talk about more later on in the feedback. Uh, and here is the, of that grouping of feedback that are all very similar that I want to read all at once and let Jimmy respond to it. Uh, Mrs. Cracker on YouTube said, These recordings were heartbreaking. God have mercy on all the faithful departed. May they rest in peace. Amen. Ma'al Siklan on YouTube wrote, I could only listen to 24 minutes of this before I had to stop. Just too heartbreaking. Kristen on Facebook wrote, Thank you for this episode. It had me crying at work, but it was also really good to hear the facts about what really actually happened. Allie Johnson on YouTube wrote, I'm Canadian, and so I remember 9-11, and just listening to this, I am crying again, especially the phone calls from passengers to their families. Agent JS09 wrote on YouTube, I was in junior high when 9-11 happened, and it affected me very profoundly. I suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for some years, and I avoided any news or information on it afterward for quite some time. I decided to listen to this today, and I can't believe that after 20 years I still have so many emotions around it. When I watch footage or hear audio from that time, it is very powerful to me. It was like I was being transported back in time. I cried during this episode, and then I felt a profound peace. I wonder if I never fully dealt with that anxiety and emotional pain, and this episode was somehow therapeutic and helped me process it. And I appreciate all that feedback. We got a lot of feedback about how emotional these episodes were for people. Some, uh, like Mao Seklan, said they couldn't get through it, and I totally understand that. It was particularly the first of the 9-11 episodes we did that was the more emotional because we actually played phone conversations and transmissions from the planes. And I, I tried to present those as neutrally as possible and not to inflame things, but they were an important part of the evidence. And it's, it's harder to dismiss that evidence if you actually hear it for yourself. And so I, I thought it was important for evidentiary reasons that we include some of that. But, um, but I understand how it could how it could be very emotional for people. And indeed, God bless, like Mrs. Cracker said, God bless all the souls and the suffering they went through. I'm glad that Agent JS09 was able to find some peace after going through that material. Um, I have found that to be an approach. So what Agent JS09 described was initially being traumatized years ago by this event, taking some time away from it, and then coming back to it and facing the audio evidence we presented and working through that and finding peace on the other side of it. And that's something that I can testify working to in my own life. There have been things that I've been very sensitive to that were traumatic for me, and I found if I put it on the shelf for a few years, I would have time to heal and then I could come back and face it again at a later time and deal with it and find peace. And it wasn't traumatic for me the way it used to be. So I would encourage listeners to think about if, would that principle work in their own lives. If there are things that are traumatic for them, it's okay to take a break from it and give yourself a chance to heal. But then it's also good periodically to re-engage with whatever the traumatizing thing was as part of working through the process and eventually coming out the other side. Michael wrote on Facebook, thanks for doing these episodes. I get very emotional every year on this anniversary. I appreciate your non-emotional approach to this horrendous event. Yeah, as always on Mysterious World, we try to present things in a very neutral way. Um, Personally, for me, and I'm sure it was for Dom, I mean, 9-11 was an emotional experience in revisiting this and listening to those tapes. And I had to listen to a lot more than what we put on the air 
Um, it was an emotional experience for me, but I try to, in, when I'm in analysis, mystery presenting mode, I try to keep it very neutral. Yeah, same for me. When I was reading the outline and listening to the uh, to the, the various recordings before, it brought it all back to me and was very emotional to me too. Um, Rick on Facebook wrote, I had very mixed emotions about listening to these two episodes. I wasn't sure that I needed to hear a rehash of this painful event, but I started listening to the first episode and not surprisingly found it interesting and well presented. Both episodes were produced in a fair and thoughtful manner. And thank you, Rick. We really try to be fair to different points of view and consider them open-mindedly. Uh, Steph on YouTube wrote, you failed on this one, Jimmy. It's very obvious that you haven't done in-depth research on 9-11. Twins was put down by controlled demolition. You fell for the New World Order narration. Well, uh, I'm not infallible, and I, you know, how much research one considers in-depth is a subjective question, because you could always say, oh, you could have done more research than you did. And it's true. I could have turned this into a 9-11 podcast and researched it every week for a year or more. Um, but I had to draw a line somewhere, and based on the evidence that I was able to assimilate in a reasonable amount of time, which I tried to get from multiple sources, both uh, pro and anti standard accounts, um, I, I didn't find that the evidence I was able to uh, develop and assimilate pointed in the direction of a controlled demolition. But uh, I respect people who have other opinions, which is why I, as long as they're polite, I allow them to have their say in the feedback, too. Uh, Morton, Martin Cornell on YouTube writes, Thanks for shedding some light on this terribly complex issue with unending technical arguments on both sides. A logical follow-up would be the anthrax attacks that followed shortly thereafter, and then perhaps an episode on the seemingly unquestionable manipulation about the non-existent WMDs in Iraq in 2003. We'll definitely have a follow-up on the anthrax attacks. Um, that's something I've planned for a long time. I hadn't really planned one to date on the WMDs. Um, there, I'm aware of competing schools of thought on that. And I don't know if we have enough declassified information to be able to fully address that at this time. Um, because I want to give all perspectives on that a fair shake, just like I want to give everybody a fair shake, but I'll consider it and see what information I can find. And we may end up doing that. That one, even though it's still sensitive, is old enough now that we may have enough evidence declassified that it would be something we could take a reasonable look at. Henry wrote on YouTube, as someone who was born in November of 2001 and therefore with no memory of the 9-11 attacks, I think it's very easy for people of my generation to doubt the official story simply because we have no emotional attachment to the event and have been raised in an incredibly politically polarized time in which mistrust of the government is the norm rather than the exception. We really don't have even have anything comparable to the 9-11 attacks. There's no Pearl Harbor or JFK assassination for our generation. And so when we hear about a great patriotic surge or some communal coming together, it strikes us as patently absurd to the point it must be polarized. Be grateful that your generation does not have a Pearl Harbor or JFK moment because they are very traumatizing. Uh, probably at some point your generation will get one because world history is messy. Um, whether the older generation will still be around for it or not, I don't know. But it seems that there are usually, in the course of a human lifetime, a few such events, at least in the last century or two there have been. And when the next one comes, I hope and pray that people will be able to pull together. I thought that things were very polarized in the 90s during the Clinton administration, and I thought they became even more polarized after the election of George W. Bush. And it was fascinating to me how there really was, I mean, not everybody pulled together, but there really was a sense of pulling together in the wake of this traumatic event. And even though people still had their disagreements, the polarization wasn't the same. Whether we've crossed the point of no return with polarization, I don't know. So I don't know what would happen 
at the next time we have a 9-11 or a Pearl Harbor. But um, I hope we pull together, and we can certainly all pray that we do. Uh, and one Dave on YouTube wrote, Very well done. I was 29 years old when it happened, and I've never really paid attention to 9-11 truth or stuff. I appreciate the evidence-based approach while being as fair as possible to different points of view. Thank you so much, and one Dave. Uh, Four Clubs on YouTube wrote, Making this episode required a lot of courage, given how emotionally invested people are on this. I, I agree. It did require a, and I had some trepidation about doing this because I knew there would be a lot of reactions uh, from people who had different opinions on both sides. Some of them would be very strongly stated. Some people might attack the show over it. Uh, and we did get a lot of really passionate discussion after this, a lot of feedback. Uh, but I think uh, on balance, people appreciated it, no matter what their perspective was. There are a few people who were very disappointed with the conclusions we came to, and a few people got rude or things like that. But actually, I was, I was very uh, gratified by the response from the audience overall, even from people who disagreed with the conclusions. Um, they seemed to, re uh, on balance, to respect what we were doing, and that's really great. Chevron wrote on YouTube, I was born six months after the 9-11 attacks, and it's interesting, although somewhat strange, for me to listen to the details of such a momentous tragedy. This was a great episode, and I enjoyed how you presented the differing viewpoints. I used to dismiss any 9-11 conspiracy theory as simply being crazy. While you also disagree with many theories concerning the flights, you present their viewpoints in a calm and careful manner, which I could learn from. Anyways, thank you for the interesting content, as always. And thank you, Chevron. It's it's really great to hear. And we heard from another uh, listener who was also born after 9-11. And it's great to have your perspectives as well on all this. Uh, Reese Birch wrote, this piece is an insult to truth seekers. You are doing damage, sir, broadcasting your juvenile assumptions and your bootlicker mentality, just hitting all the official talking points and counterpoints and approved explanations. Shameful. Well, uh, so this was one of the more uh, pointed uh, responses we got where you know, it's a little bit rude. Uh, you know, I, I can assure you I am not a bootlicker for anybody's position. If you go, as we mentioned in the 9-11 episodes themselves, I have repeatedly devoted evidence to government maldoing by the U.S. government. And so I have no problem pointing out when government officials uh, are up to no good. That is not an issue. I'm not some bootlicker for the established order. Uh, so I would encourage you to maybe take a listen to previous episodes and how we handled those and reevaluate the 9-11 episodes in light of that. Um, even if you don't agree with the same conclusions, I think you may find a greater appreciation for the approach we take. Uh, here's another group of uh, comments and feedback that we got all sort of related, so I'll read them all at once. Uh, Brent sent an email, says, I want to commend Jimmy on his interview with Dr. Gwen Lindy. What a fantastic and open discussion on her personal experience during 9-11. I really appreciated hearing Dr. Lindy's depiction of the events and the straightforward, logical conclusions she drew from being at the doorsteps of the Pentagon that day. Your episode on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 has finally put to rest so many of my nagging questions relating to the official story. Thank you for the somber piece and for tying up many of the loose ends. Elizabeth Kane wrote on YouTube, Terrific program, Jimmy. Regarding Dr. Gwen Lindy, what an interesting, articulate woman, and you were the perfect intellectual match for her interview. Well done. Todd Jambon wrote on YouTube, That's awesome. She happens to be a listener to this program. She's a Joe Rogan quality guest. Amanda wrote on YouTube, Great interview. Dr. Lindy's fascinating. I hope Jimmy will get to, a chance to interview her again about something. And James Seguian wrote, Regarding the interview with Dr. Lindy, Jimmy asked the questions I would ask as someone who believes 9-11 was an inside job. Not that Jimmy agrees with me. That I do not know. So I really loved having uh, the interview with Dr. Gwen Lindy. I thought she was an, a, a really, really good guest. I could have talked to her for a lot longer <clears throat> Um, than we did, but it was a great interview, and I would love to have her on again. And the fact she has a PhD in geology 
And sometimes we cover mysteries that deal with geology means we may be able to have her again uh, on that or some other subject. But I thought she was just a, f a wonderful guest, and I really appreciate all the people who uh, uh, who said so in the comments. Anytime we have a guest and you like them and you like what they had to say, please do let us know in the comments because it's not just us you're telling that to. The guests also will be encouraged by your feedback. And I was encouraged by uh, James Sajian's feedback uh, as someone who believes that 9-11 was an inside job. He thought I was able to ask the questions he would want to ask. And so I really appreciate that, even though we have different conclusions about the event. I'm, I'm glad he saw the value in what I was trying to do. And regarding Dr. Lindy, I, I think we have some of the m most intelligent and interesting listeners and viewers of this show. And uh, I would love to, to talk to more, to have you, in, you know, talk to more people when it's appropriate for whatever mystery we're having. So th that's fantastic. Uh, DT writes on YouTube, what about the Americans funding the Mujahideen in the early takeover of Afghanistan from the Russians, who, in my opinion, tricked the Americans in taking an unfertile land? Is it far-fetched America would fund terrorists that led an attack on U.S. soil? I'm just a first responder in New York at the Freedom Tower. Well, I, I think that America did fund terrorists that led to an attack on U.S. soil. They did during the, uh, during the 19, I guess, 80s and 90s. They funded the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and that led to the Taliban taking over Afghanistan and sheltering al-Qaeda, and they got, uh, al-Qaeda got materials that, you know, had originally been uh, used against the Soviets uh, and been given to the Mujahideen in, by you know the CIA and stuff like that. So I think that it it's not at all far fetched to say, oh wow, we funded these people and then they turned around and bit us. I think that's quite true. Um, what I don't think is that there's good evidence that U.S. officials deliberately brought about 9/11. Uh, TD9 wrote on YouTube, Jimmy, I love these shows, but I think you're overlooking a few very important issues pertaining to possible Israeli involvement. We know how influential the Zionist neocon movement was in America at the time. It wouldn't necessarily have to be an Israeli operation alone, nor an American inside job, but a combination of both. We have factual evidence of Israel orchestrating false flag attacks like the Levon Affair, and evidence of them deliberately attacking an American ship, the USS Liberty. You also didn't mention the dancing Mossad agents who were detained on 9-11. They were caught celebrating while the towers burned and later admitted to having their cameras set up to document the event. Okay, so um, listeners, can, if they don't remember, they can go back and listen to our discussion of the idea that, uh, that this may have been an attack staged by uh, Israeli intelligence, the Mossad. Um, and I outlined, I said, any nation can attack any other nation, basically. Nations don't have friends, really. They have interests. And if it's in their interest to do something or let something happen, they're perfectly capable of doing that. And that includes Israel as much as any other nation. The question, and I then went on to outline, well, under what circumstances? would it make sense for is Israeli intelligence to stage a massive, I mean, the worst terrorist attack ever on American soil? And I outlined some, some conditions where that might make sense. It just wasn't this situation. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'm going to take a, a, based on your feedback, I'm going to take a closer look at the Levin affair and the USS Liberty. Um, I know a little bit about them, but not a lot. But my immediate impression is, okay, staging a false flag on a warship that is very distant from the U.S. is different than staging a false flag in New York City and killing more people than has ever been killed before in a terrorist attack in the United States. Um, they're just different orders of magnitude, and I think the Israeli government would be much more hesitant to do the latter than the former, because the consequences would be so much graver. The USS Liberty incident didn't lead to this massive national uprising and demand for vengeance the way 9-11 did. And so, so I, I, I think that 
the situations are are different. But I will look into it more. In terms of the dancing, most the dancing uh, Israelis. Um, so think about it. If you're really a Mossad agent, now you may set up a camera to take pictures of some dramatic event. I mean, we, people whip out their cell phones all the time now, and so people taking pictures of an event isn't particular evidence one way or another. Um, but then having pictures of yourself dancing, is that more consistent with what a intelligence agent from a an agency as competent as the Mossad would do? Or is it more consistent with being a jerk? Because the idea was at last the Americans are feeling what we've been feeling all this time, and that's what they were celebrating, that America would have a greater understanding of what it's like as an Israeli to be subject to attacks in daily life. And dancing as a response is just being a jerk. I, I have a little too much respect for the Mossad and its professionalism if they really had sent agents to blow up the World Trade Centers, which is very improbable on its face. But if they had done that, they their agents wouldn't be stupid enough to have pictures of themselves dancing in celebration. So that would be my take on that. Uh, JTR Latinist wrote on YouTube, as someone who has been to Afghanistan and has seen a good portion of the southern side of it, I find it somewhat humorous when people tell me I was there for oil. Because the whole time I was there, I never saw one pipeline or, or one pump or one drill for oil. Compared to other Middle Eastern countries, it's not that rich in oil. Don't get me wrong, the region is rich in resources, but not oil. It's mostly minerals and rare metals, something that we did not mine or take. Something that China is now very interested in now that we're gone. And China is indeed very interested in Afghanistan now that we're gone. And the lack of U.S. leadership on issues relating to China is a worrying sign. By the way, um, we have an upcoming uh, pair of episodes, which I've already done the interview for, but they're they're not on the schedule yet, or they're coming up on the schedule, um, that I did with Major Bill Ray. Uh, Bill Ray uh, was an army officer who was another one of the U.S. government's psychic spies in the Stargate program. So we're going to be, in fact, he was uh, the military uh, commander of the of the Fort Meade unit for a while. And we're going to be talking to him about that. But after that, he uh, became a civilian contractor for the military and served in Afghanistan. And I talked to him. We, we taped our interviews right after the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, and there was all the horror at the airport and stuff like that. And so I talked to him about that, and so that'll be coming up in future episodes. Excellent. Uh, Paul Doris wrote on YouTube, For a long time, I've been seeking out solid info and analysis of this subject. Episode 172 presents the best reasonable analysis I've heard. You did a great job with this. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I can't be perfect. I can't always be right, but I always try to be reasonable. So thank you very much. Excellent. And thank you all for your very excellent feedback. Uh, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? Well, a couple of 9-11 headlines. Uh, the first is a news summary of a recently declassified FBI memo that continues to document relations between, or communications, between the hijackers and certain Saudi officials. That was something we talked about um, in the second 9-11 episode. The U.S. government, there is evidence that even though the U.S. government didn't cause 9-11, it did cover up uh, significant Saudi interactions that could indicate complicity of some sort in 9-11 by at least some Saudi officials. And uh, since 9-11, various companies and the families of 9-11 survivors have been trying to sue Saudi Arabia for billions of dollars. And the Saudi line is, well, we didn't have any involvement, um, we're innocent and so forth, but the families have been trying to get more information declassified. And in the 9-11 episode part two, we talked about the declassification of the so-called 28 pages. 
And even though they still had some redactions in them, that was a big step. Well, now there's been another. There's this new FBI memo that contains uh, 16 pages of information. It's also partially redacted, but it does contain new information discussing links between the terrorists and certain Saudi officials. So we'll have a news summary of that. And I don't know why news summaries don't link the, the stories and papers they're talking about. This is the age of the internet. Attention all journalists. If you're talking about a paper or a document, link it, okay? <laughs> um, it's not like TV where you can't give people a link they can press. You can, so do, so people like me don't have to hunt for the thing. Well, I did hunt for it. And so we'll also have a link to the newly declassified 16-page paper. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for hunting for it for us. So that'll do it for us for this time. We do want to hear from you. What are your theories about whether life exists on Mars? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Aikens Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world. So, Jimmy, what are we going to talk about next time? Next time, we're doing an anniversary episode. We're going back to the 1970s to look at the mystery of the most famous airline hijacker of all time who got away with it, the famous D.B. Cooper. Excellent, excellent. This has been a long-requested topic, so that's great. Including so, folks, we... by you. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm, that's why I'm kind of excited about it. <laughs> Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World Bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Fearvento Law PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters, accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit FearventoLaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O Law.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you, and be sure to stick around after the credits for Dr. Jane's A Look at Things That Don't Exist. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Nothing is science unless we have evidence. Things can't leave traces unless they are there. Without concrete data, we must express hesitance. Spurious beasties had better beware. Where, where, better beware. Sometimes the truth can be terribly dull. Next time a sea monster clamors aboard with you, feed it a fish head and call it a gull. Nothing is science unless it is testable. Experiments don't work when nothing is there. Opinion and hearsay are simply detestable. Psychokinetics had better beware. Clean up the mess, blame it all on the cat. Nothing is science until it is quantified. Just try to measure a thing that's not there. Numbers legitimize, render things bona fide. Hunches and feelings had better beware. Seized by 
emotions most passionate Take out your ruler, determine their size Nothing is science unless it's disprovable Can't disprove something when nothing is there Knowledge is power and truth is immovable Myth and religion had better beware Where, where, better beware If it's not there, there's no grief it can bring Next time you're struck by divine revelation Remember St. John and forget the whole thing Nothing is science unless it's repeatable. One isn't valid, there must be a pair. Strict repetition of facts is unbeatable. Little green aliens better beware. Where, where, better beware. Things don't exist if they're truly unique. Next time a spaceship alights on your patio, it's not real until it comes back twice a week. Science lends credence, defines our reality, states its decrees with definitive air, claims to be fair and without partiality, and won't even glance at the things that aren't there. Where, where, better beware Science takes notes as the world trundles by Points back to old fingers at blind faith and innocence Missing the moat in its own sterile eye Where, where, better beware Science takes notes as the world trundles by Points back to old fingers at blind faith and innocence Missing the mode in its own sterile